Hey, welcome back everybody. It's Soapbox Sunday here at Blue Glow Electronics. It is actually Wednesday, 2-13, uh, 2019. I just happened to get up early this morning and thought I might stitch together a few things. Um, this should be a good video though. I've got some, uh, some good content in store for you. So let's dive on in. All right, I think I finally got my arms around my challenges with some of the video quality issues I've been working with on the channel here. Um, the bottom line is um, I was struggling to get uh, Camtasia to work properly at 1080p, and I thought it was the software. So someone recommended to me to, uh, to switch over to the um, DaVinci Resolve software set, which I've been using a little bit. Um, and I've been using many cams to do the recording with, and I've not gotten good at either one of them yet, but it won't, won't take me long. They're not that different. But what I've ran into is that um, I'm struggling there the same way as I did um, with Camtasia. And, and what I've came to realize is my graphics card is just too old and can't keep up. So um, I've ordered a new graphics card, a new NVIDIA card. I've ordered a new CPU, a new motherboard, new memory, uh, 32 gig of memory. So um, we will see how this all pans out here over the next week or two. This video is still the same quality as I've been making before at 720p. Um, we're going to try to bump things up to 1080p here real soon, though. So stay tuned. All right, I'm going to own up to where I may have missed something for you guys. When I made the video on two bread plating, which, by the way, I've gotten great feedback on, um, I kind of missed a very practical element of what Mike calls red plating. Uh, I kind of covered it technically, but then the real-world application I kind of skipped over a little bit, and a viewer called me out on it. They basically said in one of my comments, hey, the thing I see that causes uh, red plating the most is uh, dirty tube sockets. And, you know, I thought, they're exactly right. I mean, I've seen that many times. I just failed to kind of call that out. Um, I mean, I, I did call it out in, when I said, you know, your, maybe your bias is off or, you know, something of that nature. Um, or the voltages are incorrect or the resistor values are wrong or whatever. But the reality is a scenario that could cause that is, let's just say you got your tube plugged in there. And maybe the uh, the grid's not making a good connection, or maybe your screen's not making a good connection. There's a lot of things that, uh, or maybe your maybe even your B plus is not there, but your screen voltage is. Those things can cause issues with your tubes. And so um, I just want to call out this individual was right. So um, if you ever got a tube red plating, one thing you should definitely check: make sure your tube socket's clean and that the tube um, socket is grabbing your pins very well. So. Um, Maybe we'll make a video on how to uh, tighten up tube sockets at some point, but um, just keep that in mind. All right. I had a viewer send me some mail here recently, uh, which I get from time to time. And uh, they said they just picked this up somewhere and it was uh, a bunch of random stuff. There's a bunch of, uh, there's three um, fuse holders in a little bag um, of interest here. Oh, this is what's great though. Look at this. A whole bag full of uh, terminal uh, strips of all different sorts and sizes. I'll definitely, I'll break these out and put them into the little bags, how I have them sorted and organized. They will definitely get some use. A whole bag full of switches here. These are the, these look like the old type, a couple of them that were used on uh, uh, some of the Dynaco gear. And you got a rocker switch or two here as well. That's pretty neat. And last but not least, a uh, silicon power transistor. <laughs> never know. I always keep this stuff. Um, you never just never know what you'll run across. But um, if any of you guys got junk laying around you don't want, want to send it to me, I'll be glad to uh, open it here on the air and put it to good use. Um, better than better than tossing it out, that's for sure. Thanks everyone for that have sent me stuff. All right, here we have some more of uh, what I would call viewer submissions of the amplifiers that are built. Dave here built this one. Looks just about like mine. So he followed it kind of to a T, which I like. You know, it uh, means he paid attention to the detail of, of what we did. And uh, even on the inside, we used a few different capacitors and parts here. But overall, a very similar build. But what I was going to say is I get emails from you guys that have built these things. And this is the theme across all of them. I'm not going to read any one of them. But it's basically, you know, for years I've wanted to do this. And your video series, Mark, is really what pushed me over the edge. By the way, 
beautiful little amp from Eric here. Looks very similar, but looks like maybe he used a different power supply here on it. Um, I like the layout of the knob and switches and whatnot. But um, any rate, um, you know, the fact that I've helped people get over the line where they've thought about this, wanted to do it, but now they've got a video series they can follow in depth and it actually inspired them to do this. Um, it means everything to me. Uh, makes all these videos and the time I put into this worth it. Um, some of these guys tell me they've been wanting to do this for decades. And this is what really kind of tripped them across the line and helped them uh, actually go do it. So um, this one's pretty cool here, by the way, from John T. He said this was a blend of my single-ended design and the KT88 design. He basically did the split, power, split rail power supply. You can see here the two chokes on the top from the um, 807 design, but then he kind of built the rest of it with the KT-88. So he, he did a combination of the two. Looks beautiful, split the power supply out over here on the right, put up a metal divider uh, to keep any noise out. I think that's a wonderful idea. Somebody's got more metal working skills than I do. And this one from Lionel, absolutely beautiful. I love the color scheme. It's just so subtle. Love the kind of, uh, I don't even know what you call that, uh, aquish kind of color. That and the black um, and the wood just go together so well. So thanks everybody for sending me these videos. All right, up next, I get viewers and subscribers that ask the question of, hey, in your KT-88, single-ended, 807, whatever build, you recommended using this type of resistor, but I went to order it and they were out. Um, what do I do? All right, what are your recommendations on resistors? So, a couple things. First and foremost, I am not associated with any of these companies I'm showing you. I'd get zero kickback. Um, it's just where I happen to order stuff from myself. Um, first and foremost, in my videos, I recommended ordering from Parts Connection, although they're in Canada, shipping's a little more and uh, takes a little longer to get to you. They carry the Kwame brand. And what I like about the Kwame's, Super low noise, they sound kind of like a carbon comp uh, resistor, um, but then they come in two watt sizes, so it's really safe throughout the amplifier, no matter where you go to use this two watt size, and I like that a lot, and they're pretty inexpensive, a dollar ten a piece you can see here, but the problem is you get to order some of these and they're out of stock, okay, so people say, well, what do you do next? Up next, what I like are the PRP resistors. These are actually made here in the USA and Iowa. Um, I would pick the one watt size. There's there's only one or two places in the amp that this would not work. Um, so if you got questions on that, you could ask me. But they have just about every size known to man. They're nice little red um, resistors. And I used quite a few of these, I think, in the 807 build um, where I couldn't get the, uh, the other size I wanted. Also, um, if you go to Sonicraft, which is in the U.S., um, they carry the, uh, the PRP resistors here, as you can see, at 92 cent a piece. Uh, another one that they carry that, um, that I like is the Tachyman resistors. Uh, they're carbon film ones, and I would get the one watt ones here, and you can see they're about $1.12 a piece. Um, so it's all, it's all kind of in preference, but there's a couple options for you when it comes to resistors. And feel free to mix and match. Um, I kind of like to, to keep them all the same. Um, it's not always possible. Ah, I remember it wasn't the 807 build I used the uh, PRPs. It was the uh, the Leak uh, TL50s where I ended up using a lot of those. So I uh, hope this helps. All right, so I'm sitting on the couch last night. Got my iPad. I'm scrolling through uh, different things. I uh, decided to check my email and up pops my Bottlehead newsletter that I get regularly. Okay. And I'm looking at it, and, and this is the, I think it's pronounced uh, Kachu, uh Premium 300B Amplifier, special pricing on this thing. And then I get to reading about it, and honestly, I, I got drawn in. Um, <laughs> it, uh, you know, but the more I read, I was like, wow. The, and the bottom line is, that these guys have basically been tweaking towards this amplifier for almost 20 years. Um and um, yeah, I didn't order one. I mean, and this video is not about Bottlehead, by the way. If you want to order one, um, go ahead. They're great kits. Uh, one, one disappointing thing I found about Bottlehead is they do a really good job of telling you how to assemble something, but they do absolutely nothing to tell you how this amplifier works. So um, it's one of the downsides I would recommend those guys change. But um, anyway, I, I just got to reading what all they had done to this amplifier to kind of make it this, you know, top echelon in their opinion. 
of uh, of amplifiers. And um, just by the way, this video is not about bottle head. So <laughs> it got me thinking on this topic. Okay, and the topic was: say you take something like the 807 amp that we just built, right? And you get it built, and you start listening to it. Okay, and you're like, wow, this sounds really good. Sounds better than a lot of things I've heard before. Um, but I wonder if there's something that sounds better. And the, and the question I was really pondering in my head is, where do you spend your time? Do you spend your time saying, hey, I'm going to build the next amp, right? So, ooh, I was thinking about a uh, push-pull uh, EL34 amplifier. Maybe that would sound better, right? And so I divert my, my time, and I'm talking about anybody's time. Do you divert it to the next amp? and um, build it and then when you get done say wow i think that either sounded better or worse than the one i built before or do you spend your time back with the first one you built trying to tweak it improve it ever ever little slightest inch of improvement here and there um you know it's one of those things where you put time into something and the overall design gets you about i would say 98 percent there and then is that 2%, you might spend as much or more money trying to get that 2% of perfection, uh, time and energy as well, that you spent on the first 98%. Um, you know, if I changed out these types of resistors, um, if I tweak the bias here just a little bit, what if I change this over to a different type um, input tube? You know, there's a lot of things you could do. What if I change the output transformers? Um, it was just, it got me thinking, you know, what's the right approach for someone? Is it to continue tweaking something till they think they've gotten perfection? Or is it better to jump on to the next thing and uh, kind of dive in and do something else? I don't know the answer, but um, my, my ADD is likely to keep me from ever perfecting anything, to be honest. I'm likely to jump on to the next design. Maybe 10 years, I'll come back around and say, hey, there's a couple things I wanted to do to that amp. Uh, let me tweak and do a couple things. But in the moment, I'm more likely to kind of chase the next thing. I just thought I'd get your, your thoughts and feedback on this and uh, where, how it kind of resonates in your head and what, uh, what path you might would take. Okay, I got a question into my inbox and the title of the email was noob questions so I did not title this that the, the sender did and um, basically I won't read you the whole email here but the gist of it guy just turned 50 he's wanting to get into restoring some older uh, receivers whatnot he's got some units to practice on he just wanting to validate a th few things he's gonna order and he wanted to get my thoughts on it so the first ones he's thinking are a requirement are the Heiko F888D um, soldering station and the answer to that is yes yes and more yes okay I personally believe that is the best value for the money soldering station on the planet right now if you shop right you can get this thing right at a hundred dollars or under maybe um, it, it is an amazing unit I, I use it hours and hours every week I solder literally hours every week I have not ran into anything in the audio space. Now, I am talking about circuit boards, uh, vintage stereos, point-to-point -point kind of stuff. I've not ran into anything this thing would not do and excel at doing it, okay? Now, I'm not saying you couldn't go out and spend five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars plus on a higher-end solder station and possibly have some more flexibility, especially if you get into doing all kinds of surface mount work okay but that's not typically what I'm talking about as it relates to audio so for audio work yes yes and more yes on this unit um, if anybody wants to debate whether that's the best unit on the planet I'll give you my cell phone number I'd love to have that debate um, up next the Atlas DCA 55 it's a little unit you hook up the three wires to any three lead component uh, uh, device diode or two lead diode um, transistor whatever um, doesn't matter what order you hook it up in it'll come back and tell you what it is tell you whether it's good or not and tell you some statistics about it like the HFE gain or whatnot an amazing unit yes 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 um, if you're gonna do any type of transistor servicing 
uh, of transistor type units. And it doesn't matter whether you're pulling out a teeny little preamp transistor or um, whether you're pulling out a great big power transistor, this thing will test it. Um, and so it's a great unit. There is a more expensive version of this that lets you do curve tracing. And um, I think for the average person um, doing uh, simple repairs, this is all you need. Up next, the Atlas ESR70. Yes, 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 I love this unit. Small, simple, compact, turn it on, works. Uh, measures capacitor uh, equivalent series resistance. You do have to get good at using one of these in circuit. Um, if you're testing capacitors that are still on the board. You'll learn when it's working. You'll learn when and you're getting false readings because of other things in the circuit. You, The more you do with it, you'll get good at it. You'll learn when you need to pull the capacitor out and test it. And by the way, if you're going to pull the capacitor out and test it, you might as well replace it, is my opinion. But the answer is yes. Up next, I have mixed feelings on this one. A Heiko desoldering gun. So um, I've got one here. It's the FR300, okay? Um, but for many, many years, I operated with nothing more than cheap seven uh, and maybe ten dollar um, solder suckers. Okay, um, it, just, it wasn't until a few years ago my wife uh, broke down and bought me one of these. Uh, the kids did for a holiday, um, and so here's where I'm at with it. Okay, I, I absolutely love this. It 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 saves a ton of time when restoring a vintage stereo. Um, you just boom, boom, boom. There goes the three uh, uh, solder connections for that transistor, reach around to the other side and you pull it right out. It's simple. Same with a capacitor, resistor, whatever. Um, whereas this, a little more time consuming. But for me, it's, it's, it's all about how much time do you spend doing this stuff. If over the next year, you're likely to restore two stereo receivers, go this route. I don't know if it's worth the investment. These things are pretty expensive. Um, if over the next couple of years you think you're going to restore 20 or so receivers, go do this. And I would say it's also relevant to your uh, disposable income as well. If the price of one of these is the same as you know you going to McDonald's and <laughs> or on a Saturday night and dropping uh, you know, the, the kind of disposable income you spend every week, then maybe not a big deal. Just do it. Um, if you're going to have to save up for three or four months for one of these, um, to be able to get one, um, I'd really question it because um, you can do the same effectiveness here just a little slower. So both are effective, I guess is my point. Oscilloscopes, yeah, um, on the recommendations. First recommendation, don't spend a fortune, okay? You don't need a 300 megahertz or 1 gigahertz scope to measure the 20 kilohertz audio range, okay? You can get by with a much lower bandwidth scope. 50 megahertz, 20, 10, even 5. Uh, not that there's a lot of 5 megahertz scopes out there. But um, one thing I would recommend. So you can get a nice scope in the $50, range um, eBay that would do what you need. Uh, get a 20 megahertz scope or something, okay? But if you're going to do a good bit of work, I would recommend jumping up to the line of, of products that would have an on-screen display that would measure voltage um, of your signal, that would measure the time intervals between your signals so you can figure out frequency, things of that nature. I use up here on the bench the Tektronix 2246. This happens to be a calibrated unit. I paid about $250 for it. You could probably pick up a non-calibrated unit um, in the $200 range. Um, I also use this a lot. It is the Rigol DS1024Z, uh, 1054Z. This is about a $300, $350 scope. Uh, it's a digital scope. It has all the readouts I was just talking about on screen, live. Um, amazing little unit for the money. So um, either one of those would be great choices if you're into spending... Uh, you know, two to three hundred dollars or so. Signal generator, yeah, just something that'll hit the audio frequency range. Um, a lot of good Heath kit options out there. Try to get something that will do a sine wave and a square wave. Those are the two things you're going to want to use the most in measuring um, audio signals. So um, you don't need anything fancy. A lot of fifty and sixty dollar options on eBay that would probably work out just fine with with you. As far as everything else, I've, I've done a couple bench walkthroughs. Good tools are, are, are always an option. You know, simple things like magnifying glasses, um, whatnot, I use all the time. So uh, you'll figure it out as you go along. But um, don't sacrifice on quality. Get good stuff. It'll last you for years.
It's Friday at noon at the Richmond Ham Fest, and uh, it's called the Frost Fest here in Richmond, Vir Richmond, Virginia. And you can see people are starting to unload and set up at this time. We're going to walk around and see what all we might could find. Right here has a bunch of test equipment. I bought uh, some oscilloscopes and a signal tracer off of him and took it over the top. Picked up two uh, older heat kit scopes. One works well and the other parts. Uh, these have usually Muller 12AX7 or 12AU7s in them. So uh, for $5 each, wasn't a bad deal. Found a pair of uh, Ico 666 and a 667 tube tester. Guys wanting 125 each, said he would do better on the pair. Got a Heathkit uh, TC2 tube tester here for $50. Uh, lots of radio gear and radio stuff. Box of capacitors off of a guy. They're all new old stock, but there's a bunch of these uh, blue um, Aerovox capacitors in here. I'll take these home and put them on a high voltage tester and test them all the way up to their rated voltage. Uh, some of these may be very good. Some of these are the kinds I replace all the time and throw away, but for three dollars it was a good deal. I was not planning on was it snowing like crazy here. Uh, <laughs> didn't even look at the weather to be honest. I had no idea it was going to snow here. I'm just taking a run back out to the car to put some stuff up and to change shoes. Uh, love our love our uh, little Subaru here. It is the ultimate uh, practical. I gave me this. It's a half a five gallon bucket full of capacitors, but if you go through it, there's tons of the old uh, um, paper and oil caps in it. Um, so I don't know. It was good for free, and he also gave me this a, uh, a circuit board uh, kit. And it looks like it's got everything in it. Best deal of the uh, day for sure. I always carry a bunch of these banker boxes to ham fest just as a tip because um, you get something like this and you, if you hit the brakes and you ended up with 500 capacitors in the back back seat of your car but it's just a good way to kind of you know, seal things up and uh, keep things safe as you drive. There's a sealer Calypso Lidham Audio EL84 amp. Guy has a Soundcraft from the preamp. Some old Western Electric uh, Transformers of Unknown Origin and all, a pair of Alltech 9473A limiters. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, Bogan amp. Both set up with the EQ. Um, it was going when I got. Alright, how do you beat an Ampeg V7 amp which runs four 70, 7027 output tubes? for $30. It's just missing the tubes. Um, Alright, it's 5.41 a.m. Headed back to the ham fest on Saturday morning. Um, early bird gets the worm. It's about 6.40. They open the doors at 6.30. People are coming in now bringing stuff in. Caught this guy as he's coming in the door. Um, I saw the uh, FM3 tuner that I got here. And then uh, underneath of it, I believe, is an SCA 35 and I uh, asked him what he wanted for him he said 40 bucks and I said sold so I never even hit the table um, good deal picked this up when I first got here this morning at uh, it's an IT17 um, tube tester really nice old nice Icoscope um, may end up using it as is if it doesn't work it's got uh, way more than twenty dollars worth of tubes in it. Picked up a uh, Ico resistance decade box for five bucks and I got this for five bucks too, a ca capacitor decade box. I just can't help myself buy this stuff. About 7.30 on Saturday morning now. A lot of the people that are going to be setting up have already done so. We're just kind of cruising around now. Seeing what all um, is out here. Haven't done a few cool things, but nothing too extravagant. This is pretty cool. Homebrew AC watt meter and adjustable power supply. It's got a round meter like the one very I've got, and then uh, pretty cool though. I just picked up a distortion analyzer HP331A, but I kind of hate videoing deals, so this is cool. 
Elite 11 tubes, a uh, Heath Kit TC2 tube tester for $125. Hmm. But, um, so it's just one way to get in early. Get a table, bring a few items, throw it up there, put you a dollar box on it or something. Um, just kind of cruising around, seeing what all is here. As you can see, there's a lot of stuff. You know, if you come in it as an individual, you can still find a lot of good parts and whatnot. Um, but most of your stereo gear would have been snatched up by another dealer by now. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of a lot of interesting stuff here. This is just interesting. Trinidad atom bomb material. You can see it me reading on the Geiger counter over here. Looks like all the old birds are in That's pretty scary stuff, to be honest. Get some thorium. I saw some thor thorium mantles I could use in a. Uh, check it out. Make sure you put your red tickets in the prize draw at the canal station. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. A real to real unit. Send for two sugar. Pretty cool stuff here. There's a Pioneer Elite unit. Um, has an open close, so I assume it's a CD player. Found a white ceramic base 807, a couple 6L6s, and another 807. Okay, starting to load up here. I did find a pair of 6550 tubes. Um, look like tongue soles. Um, we're going to make our first. There's another one. 6550 made in USA. But uh, looks like that one's a GE. Yeah, we're going to um, start our first of many trips. You can see here, picked up a nice old RCA signal generator, just a, a nice ICO signal tracer. I think everything else I showed you last night. Trip number one to the car, a nice ICO scope I picked up. The HP331 spectrum, I mean, a uh, distortion analyzer. Two Heathkit laboratory scopes, one of which works great. And that uh, Heathkit tube tester. An old Japanese guitar amp, but it's full of uh, made in Great Britain tubes. We'll see what that is. Um, this is part of that. Oh, this is great right here. I'll show you. Um, these uh, tube sockets, the IARCs. Bought a whole box of them for $12. Uh, guy was asking a dollar a piece. Nice old general radio uh, resistance box. A Heath kit, I think it's a H7. Old spools of PTFE wire for two dollars a spool. Yeah, sorry, it's an A7 amp. Um, I think I've got a few of these already. A nice heavy-duty uh, power transformer by uh, Audio Development Incorporated. May incorporate that in some. I got to figure out where I'm going to put this stuff. I don't have any room. Let me show you what I've got here, though. I picked up an Ico Decade uh, capacitance box. I'll find a place for that and a. Um, resistance decade box, but these are the coolest. These are decade boxes. Check this out. Uh, goes from 0.1 ohms all the way up through 10k ohms, and it's done by moving these little slugs in between these little brass um, or copper. Not sure which. Uh, so I mean brass. Um, I don't know. Just just too cool. Um, certainly made in Germany. As you can see, got the vehicle full all the way up to the front seats here and uh, some even in the floorboard, but uh, it is, what, 9, 9, 10. We are going to head on out of here. All right, just a few other thoughts from the Richmond Ham Fest. Um, one, there were very few tubes that came into that place, so tubes are getting harder and harder to find. I've been going to Richmond for quite a few years now, and... Um, this was just not a good year. Even though I picked up a handful of things, um, it was not a great year. No big patches. And there were quite a few audio guys like myself running around. I uh, spent a good bit of time talking to a few of them and um, really, really enjoyed the social aspect of it. We sat around and talked audio gear quite a bit. Um, but we were all looking for the tubes and it just there just wasn't that much there. I did see a couple other guys pick up a couple pieces of uh, stereo gear, so I was not the only one snatching up some good stuff um so 
you know, like I mentioned, uh, maybe get you a table, bring some stuff you've got for sale, and that gets you in the door early, lets you get around and shop the other dealers as they're bringing stuff in as well. But um, outside of all that, I, you know, I did uh, did did run into Dennis Head there um, Friday afternoon, and we had some good conversations. I got to listen to him talk to um, some other ham guys about... Um, and just how his business kind of evolved over the years. It was really an interesting story. I'd love to get him on interview sometime, maybe tell him that same story. Um, did that, had, had, had dinner with him and a friend of his. Uh, it was great to meet him as well, uh, another ham radio buddy. And, um, you know, we just talked various audio stuff, and uh, Dennis shared a few pieces of wisdom with me that I'd really not thought of, and i um, and, uh, glad to have them in my head. Um, but you know, it was, it was a good, good trip. And, um, you know, the next morning I, I didn't spend a lot of time there Saturday. I ran around when people were unloading. Once I had seen everything that was there, you know, I went back around one or two times for some parts and various things. And then nine o'clock ish or so I bolted out of there and drove home. So it was a great ham fest. I had fun with it. Uh, next one I will be at will be the Charlotte one coming up next month. Uh, I think it's around the 10th or so. Um, same thing. I'll be there all day Friday. Uh, possibly a little bit Saturday morning, but definitely all day Friday. The Charlotte one's a little different. It is a ham fest that starts Friday at noon and goes through basically Saturday afternoon. So you get there early, early Friday during the unloading, then I'll stay in the afternoon. A few other people may show up Saturday morning, but for the most part, that one wraps up Friday night for me. But um, hope to see you there. I, I have a lot of fun at these ham fests. Hopefully you can see there's still a lot of good stuff out there to be had. Um, find the one in your local area and go visit some of them. All right, I'm going to call that a wraps for Soapbox Sunday this week. Hope you enjoyed it, and um, we'll try to creak in another video of some sort this weekend. Thanks for watching, everybody.